I just want to mention quickly, um, you can tell I still have some problems with my throat. A few weeks ago, I mentioned about my throat, and many of you have been asking, and uh, uh, I went to my ear, nose, and throat doctor on Thursday, and he didn't see any improvement. I've had some problems with allergies, and so he just kind of said it was that. So he gave me three more months before the next thing, but he told me what the next thing is, and I need your prayers the next three months because I don't want the next thing. So I'll just, I'll just put it that way. It's a test that's not pleasant. So uh, I would love to uh, be able to get through this summer and that my voice would be stronger. So if I have to cough this morning, I know you don't go to church to hear your pastor cough into the microphone. And I, I'll try not to do that. But uh, we really do appreciate your prayers. Well, I, I, just, I have a question for you this morning. And you can respond to the first one. The second one, maybe you better not. But the first question is, have you ever been disappointed by someone who made you a promise and then they didn't fulfill it? Can I see your hand? That's happened to you in your life? Yeah. That doesn't feel good, does it? Now, the second question I'm going to ask you is, uh, I don't want any response. And, And that is, have you ever told your child that you'll do something later, you know, they want to do it, can can we, can we, can we, can we, can we, and you, just to put them off, said, oh, we'll do that later, but you never intended to do it. Don't put your hand up for that, okay? That's not really a good practice, uh, because it teaches your children two things. You know, when they're real little, you can get away with that, and you can trick them, but they grow up real fast, And the day will come when they're going to figure that out. And two things that they learn from that is, number one, you can't be trusted. And number two, they don't have to tell the truth either. And so we need to make sure that we fulfill our promises. But unfortunately, we do live in a broken world. And many of us this morning raised our hands, and probably many of you that didn't raise your hands are people that wouldn't raise your hand no matter what I ask. So uh, I I think probably even more of us have experienced that where we've been disappointed by a broken promise. But today I want to point out to us that Jesus is the real promise. The Bible is full of promises, and and the Old Testament is pointing toward a a day when the Messiah would come, and Jesus is the fulfillment of the promises, and that's what the entire book of Hebrews is about, and I hope that you're figuring that out, that Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, is all about Jesus. When we talk about revealed, a glimpse of God, it's Jesus who is the glimpse that we get. God sent Jesus into the world. He became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is God, and everything that we know about Jesus, we can say we know about God. God is Jesus, and Jesus is God. They they are one in essence, and so Jesus is the real promise. And I trust that you figured that out as we've been looking at the book of Hebrews, and we have several more sermons. It's all about Jesus. But just as important, I hope that you have figured out that Calvary Wesleyan Church is all about Jesus. That, that is, that's why we do everything we do is to help people come to know Jesus as their Savior and having done that, help people to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. We do nothing else. And if we do anything else, we ought to stop it. Uh, that's what it's all about is helping people find Jesus and then having come into a relationship with Jesus to help them to grow. That's why we, when, when someone accepts Jesus as their Savior, we have a salvation celebration. There's nothing that ever happens through the ministry of Calvary Wesleyan Church that is more important, more exciting, more of something that we should celebrate than when somebody comes to know Jesus as their Savior because someone, some way, has been a witness to another person. And, and that's, that's why we're going to be starting a Saturday evening service in September is so that we hopefully will be able to reach some people that we can't reach on Sunday morning or that we don't reach. That's the the whole idea behind a Saturday evening service is to reach people for Jesus Christ. And, And that's why we hope to plant a church next year. 
We, we want to find a, a, a church planning pastor and, and a, a location and uh, make contribution toward them and, and uh, maybe give some people to them and start another church because it's been proven over the years the most effective way to reach people for Christ is through starting new churches. And we want to reach people for Jesus Christ. Uh, that's why we sponsor teens to go, or sponsor people to go to teen camp and to children's camp. It's because there is an atmosphere that's designed either for the teens or for the children, as I just prayed, where it's all for them. It, it's right at their level. The messages, the music, the, the lessons, everything that is shared, it's for the children, it's for the teens. And it's a great atmosphere to, for them to come to know Jesus as Savior. And we, we want them to go to find Jesus or to grow in Jesus and to find out in some way what Jesus wants them to do with their lives. That's why we do good news clubs over at Clearview Elementary School. And by the way, next week, the day after July 4th, July the 5th, through the rest of that week, uh, is going to be a kids club camp. And, and that's why we do the, the, the uh, kids club, the, the um, good news club through uh, Child Evangelism Fellowship is so that we can reach children in the spring and in the fall. And now this year, we've even added to the summer to do that. It's all about reaching children for Jesus. That's why we do local outreach. That's why we do domestic and cross-cultural outreach and send out teams is to reach people for Jesus Christ. That's why we do global outreach is to reach people for Jesus Christ and then to help them to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why uh, over the last several years we have changed our worship style. And uh, maybe some people don't like the change, but I wanted you to know this, God likes the change. There's no one in the whole universe that's more aware that it's 2016, not 1976, than God. Because he's the one that made it that way. And so he knows where we're at, and, and so we want to reach people today. And, and why, would, why would we risk all that we've been through to change worship style, to reach, and it's to reach people for Jesus Christ. It's the only reason that is worthwhile. And over the last several weeks, and maybe up to two months, we've been showing some videos, made new videos, and, and we've had people to give their testimonies, and you've seen some of them uh, a couple of times. We just saw some about two, two weeks ago, but I want to just remind you again at the beginning of this message, this, this is all just the introduction, by the way. We haven't gotten to preach yet, but uh, this is just kind of introducing this idea that it's all about Jesus, uh, but you've heard the testimony of, of Brooke and Jordan. Brooke was a a young lady who grew up in a home where she didn't go to church. Uh, she hadn't gone to church. She had been married to Jordan for five years, and they didn't go to church. And so it wasn't that she was against church at all. She just didn't think about church. She didn't go to church, and, and so it wasn't anywhere on her radar. Jordan, on the other hand, had grown up in church, and he wasn't mad at the church. He didn't hate the church. But as he went away to college and got married, it wasn't his priority. And so they just didn't go to church. And then they found out that a little guy was coming, little Calvin. They, they didn't know if it was a boy or a girl or what his name was going to be yet, but they knew that there was going to be a child that they were responsible for. And Jordan said, you know, Brooke, church was important to me as a child growing up, and I think it's important for our child. I'd like to go to church. And Brooke said, okay. About a year ago in July, they started coming, and Brooke received Jesus as her Savior. Jordan rededicated himself, and now little Calvin comes to church. And you know what? You know, sometimes moms are busy, and babies need attention. And so when Brooke has to do something that, and, and needs to try to keep Calvin satisfied, little Calvin loves to listen to contemporary Christian music that they hear at church. Now, isn't that amazing? That's what it's all about. And, and see, the point is, there are more people like Brooke out there in our community. 
people who have never been to church, they don't hate the church, they don't have a vendetta against the church, they just haven't thought about the church. There are people out there like Jordan who grew up in the church, even has fond memories of the church, but it's not the priority as a young adult to, to go to church. There are many other people out there like that. There are a lot of babies out there who come into a home and they need the church and they need the gospel and they need Jesus Christ. And we've seen other videos and have other testimonies. You know, not only are there more Brooks and Jordans and Calvins, but there, there's more Michael and Tobys out there. Michael gave his testimony that he practiced religion, but there was something in his life that was missing. He wasn't fulfilled, and he came and learned about repentance and turning his life to Jesus. And then Maria and Ruby, who are friends who came because someone at Calvary invited them. What, what friends do you have that would come if all you did was ask them to come? Their lives have been transformed this past year because they've come to Calvary Wesleyan Church. There's more families like the De Los Santos family. Davian came to our Good News Club at Clearview Elementary, and he gave his heart to Jesus last fall. And we didn't hear any more from them, and then in the spring he was in Good News Club again, but each time his mother would come to the closing events, and after our spring uh, closing event, they started coming to church. And in May, Jessica, Davian's mother, was baptized. Every Sunday, I can count on they're here and they're participating in worship and praising the Lord together as a family. There are people out there in our community that just don't know us and we don't know them. And it's all about Jesus, about getting out there and meeting them and finding a way to let people know that they're welcome at Calvary and that we want to share with them the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. And that's what we should be doing. People need to hear about him and they need to come to him. And as the church of Jesus Christ, it's our responsibility to go and to tell them. And so this morning we wanna talk about the real promise, Jesus. He's the real promise. In Hebrews chapter seven, verses 23 to 28, we see first of all the imperfect priesthood, the imperfect priesthood. The book of Hebrews was written to people who had practiced Judaism so that they could understand what, that Jesus was the fulfillment of the promises of God. Judaism was a, a beautiful religion that actually God himself had created and, and given to them, and, and they were a special people. But through the ages, that system began to break down, not because of God, but because of human failure. And uh, Jesus then came into the world and died for us. And, and the book of Hebrews is all about talking to people who had been raised in Judaism, had turned to Christ, and to help them to understand that Jesus is the real promise. He's the fulfillment of all those promises that they had been involved in in their Jewish religion. And the, the Jewish religion was designed by God, but yet was imperfect, and, and it was a sacrificial system. If you want to read about it, read the book of Le Leviticus, and it, it tells you a lot about it. But the, the, the price for Sin is death. The, the price for sin is the shedding of blood. And so in the Old Testament si system, animals were sacrificed as a substitute for the forgiveness of our sins. But it was a system that constantly had to be repeated because the animal's blood was not a perfect sacrifice. If it was a specific sin and an animal was, was sacrificed for that sin or for that purpose, God accepted that as the atonement for that, but then the next time a person sinned, another animal had to be slaughtered, or another event came up, and there had to be more blood that was shed. And so it was imperfect because it was the sacrifice of animals, and it was also imperfect because humans served as the priests. 
And, and the, the very priests who were offering sacrifices for the sins of the people were human beings too, and they were born in sin, and, and they had sin in their lives, and so before they could offer a sacrifice for the people, they had to offer a sacrifice for themselves because they were human beings. And guess what? Human beings die. And so when the priest died, somebody else had to become the priest, and it was generational. It was the tribe of, of uh, Levi in the... Um, Old Testament in, in, in the nation of Israel, and, and if you were born into a priest's home, you became a priest, and so when the father died, the, the son would take the, the place all down through the generations, and, and so Israel's high priests were imperfect. Like all human beings, they were sinners, and therefore they had to offer sacrifices for their own sins and also for the sins of the people, and even the most faithful priest in the Old Testament times died, and those were still ministering when the, he, the book of Hebrews was written, were also going to die. And so we had the, the, that the, the ministry of the priests, therefore, because it was human beings, was temporary. They, they gave their lives to this ministry that they were called to, that they were born into, but it was temporary. In Hebrews chapter 7, verses 8 to 19, 18 to 19 says, the former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect. And a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And who is that better priest that is coming, who came? Jesus, thank you. A teenager on the front row had to answer that for you. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, the perfect priesthood. On the cross, when Jesus atoned for our sins, he cried out, it is finished. In John chapter 19, verse 30, it says, When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus completed the work of our redemption. Nothing needs to be added to Jesus' saving work. When he was on this earth, when he said it is finished on the cross, his sal salvation for us was completed. All we need to do is to receive it and, and to accept his saving work. There is indeed nothing that can be added to it. Matter of fact, when human beings try to add to the saving grace of Jesus Christ, they begin to get into false religion and cults because there is nothing that is to be added to the blood of Jesus Christ for our salvation. And under the law, imperfect priests were appointed, but after the law, God swore by an oath that Jesus was a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And Jesus came as a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now, if you read the book of Genesis in chapter 14, there's a story that seems very incidental. It's, it, 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 it's not going to really catch your attention. Abraham had been out, and, and uh, he had been in battle and rescued Lot, and he was on his way back with the plunder that he had taken, and he came upon, upon this uh, priest, Melchizedek, and uh, he gave tithes to Melchizedek. And in Psalm 110, verse 4, a prophecy about Jesus says, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And then in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 28, and, and in this whole chapter of, of chapter 7, the Hebrew writer is putting a great deal of, of emphasis upon Jesus being the fulfillment of that. In Hebrews 7, 28, it says, for the law appoints as high priest men who are weak, but the oath which came after the law appointed the son who has been made perfect. Melchizedek received tithes from Abraham, the patriarch of the Jews, as well as all believing Gentiles uh, look at, to their faith back to the faith of Abraham. In Hebrews chapter 7, verses 4 to 7, the Hebrew writer says, Just think how great he was, talking about Melchizedek. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now the law requires the descendants of Levi who become priests to collect a tenth from the people, that is their brothers, even though their brothers are descended from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without doubt, the lesser person is blessed 
by the greater. And as, as we follow the writing of the book of Hebrews, we see that the, the Old Testament law was weak and, and, and had failed. But Jesus came to fulfill the law and not to replace it, not to do away with it, but to fulfill the law. And so many of the ceremonial laws and, and uh, some of those kinds of things in the Old Testament, we don't practice anymore because Jesus fulfilled them. We don't have to offer sacrifices because Jesus died once for all. And we'll talk more about that next Sunday. But here, the Hebrew writer is telling us that tithing is not the law. Some people today will teach and preach, and you've, if you listen to Christian radio, you've probably heard some of these preachers that say you don't need to tithe because the tithing is law. But the Hebrew writer says tithing went before the law. It, it, it's Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, and it's beyond the law. He is saying that Jesus has come in the order of Melchizedek. And so here we see, G, we see the Hebrew writer teaching us that tithes supersedes the law. It didn't start with the law of Moses. It was already in existence prior to Moses. It didn't end with Jesus coming. But here the Hebrew writer is giving us the, the image, the picture, that Jesus Christ is receiving our tithes. When you pay your tithes, you give it to the church, but it is get being given for Jesus Christ. What is the church? The church is the body of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. And any man who's married knows if you get money, it goes to the bride. No, I'm just kidding. I, I wanted to make sure you were awake. But um, we as the church receive the tithe on behalf of God. It's not a law. Matter of fact, for those who say you don't have to tithe, uh, because it's law, grace is greater than law, not less than law. If tithe is 10% of our income, grace would be greater, not 3%, but greater. And you, you we're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount in a later service, uh, series this summer. Everything that Jesus said about grace was greater than what the law required, not less than what the law required. Well, I have a video I'd like for you to watch, just a brief video, uh, lasts about four minutes. Uh, it started, this video is uh, on the stage of the largest Wesleyan church in uh, Lawrenceville, Georgia, a suburb of Atlanta, Georgia, and um, Pastor Kevin Myers is talking to a group, and then they're going to, to share with us. And I thought this might be an interesting way for you to remember what the tithe is. We'll watch this video. In today's economy, accountants get a really bad rap. <laughs> bad so, rap. you know, we thought we weren't going to fight it. We're just going to claim that. And so we are, we are redeeming the bad rap that accountants get. Well, this doesn't feel good. Perhaps I'm best off with giving a little distance to this moment. No, no, un unless you want to join us, yo. No. No. What's up, people? What's up? Yo, white tea's in the house. They call me no sense. No yeah, sense. a little bit up in here. Every day in the mail, I get nothing but bills. I could rap all day about my financial ills. Money comes in and goes right back out. I know that you know what I'm talking about. My wife just keeps cranking up the heat. And three times a day, my kids want to eat. Sprinkler! To what I got to say What I do every Friday When I get my pay Before I buy the groceries Or pay the rent I gotta give God his Full 10% He gives me a hundred I give back ten And I'm blessed all day From beginning to end Running man Clue what tomorrow will bring, but I know God's the giver of 
all good things. He's got the 411 on all of my needs, and God's got it all covered, so it ain't on me. I take it straight off the top. That's the way it's gotta be, and everything is good between God and me. New kid. When I say a hundred, you say ten. One hundred, ten. One hundred, ten. Now when we say a hundred, you say ten. One hundred, one hundred. Now it ain't complicated. Let me give you a hint. A tithe ain't nothing but ten percent. And I may not be the sharpest dude in the joint, but I know how to move a decimal point. I'm a tither now, cause that's how I roll. I'm a grateful child on the father's door. Hammer time. Now you know how to do it, so what's your excuse? You can't play God's money fast and loose. And where's your heart? Just follow the cash. I'm storing up mine in the oh, heavenly stash. When God gives a hundred, you give back ten. ten. And be blessed all day from beginning, beginning to end. end. Walk it out. So when you think of the tithe, remember these guys up here in the bad rap. But uh, again, just a reminder that all that we are trying to do for Jesus, to reach people with Jesus, to get the gospel message out, the results that we've seen in this past year of reaching people for Jesus, the way that that happens is for us as the church of Jesus Christ to honor Christ with the tithe and bring it to the church so that the needs can be met and to be able to reach people with Jesus Christ. Not only was there the imperfect priesthood in the Old Testament and the perfect priesthood in Jesus Christ, but Jesus provides the complete salvation, the complete salvation. Our eternal perfect high priest not only offered a perfect sacrifice, he was the perfect sacrifice. Jesus not only came as a priest in the order of Melchizedek that he would live forever, but he offered himself on the cross as the one who would shed his blood for us. No longer do we shed the blood of animals for a temporary solution to sin and covering for sin, but we, we come to Jesus Christ who laid down his perfect life and shed his blood for us. And because Jesus lives forever as our high priest, he saves completely. When we come to know Jesus as our Savior, he totally gives us not only forgiveness of sin for the past, but gives us strength and power and ability to live for him in the future. And in heaven, he intercedes for us. When, when you struggle, when you go through temptation, when, when you become discouraged, when you're about to give up, when you feel like you can't resist what Satan is trying to do, remember the blood of Jesus Christ was shed for you, and Jesus not only died and was buried, but he rose again, and he ascended back to the Father's right hand, and he intercedes for you in those times of your tr struggles and in the times of your strife. He intercedes for you. There's no trial or burden that is too great for him to handle. I don't know everything that you are going through in your life, but I do know this. Jesus Christ is greater than any burden you face, any trial, any difficulty that you may have. Jesus Christ is greater. And he doesn't simply save us 
from our sins and then leaves us, but he helps us all along in our pilgrimage. He stays with us and is for us and is helping us in in this whole process of living in this world and is waiting to welcome us into heaven. The complete salvation. Jesus is the real promise. He fulfilled all of the imagery of the Old Testament that the people that the Hebrew writer was writing to, they, they understood it all because they had practiced it. They had been raised in it from the time of their childhood. We may not understand all that symbolism, but I want you to know that Jesus is the real promise. He fulfilled all of that. He is the eternal priest. We don't have to go back and keep offering another sacrifice and another sacrifice and another sacrifice. One priest doesn't die and then another priest comes. Jesus Christ died once for all for our salvation. And if you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want you to know very clearly this morning that Jesus died for you. And his blood is able to forgive your sin and cleanse your sin and to help you to become a follower of his and to begin a relationship with God the Father. If you do not know Jesus as your Savior, I would encourage you to pray with me this morning. I'm going to pray a closing prayer, and then in that prayer, I'm going to pray a prayer of repentance and turning to Jesus. And if you, in your heart, say, yes, that's for me, you can know today before you leave this room, that Jesus is your Savior. You don't have to say it out loud. Just pray along with me in your heart. Lord, we thank you this morning for your great love. And we've all been hurt at times by people who have made us promises and they've broken them. But Lord, you never fail us. You never break your promise. And all of those promises that were made by the prophets and all the promises that were pictured in the ceremonies and sacrifices of the Old Testament and all the promises that that were proclaimed throughout the ages are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the real promise. And Lord, we thank you today that even now in in, uh, 2016, that you care about us, you know our needs. And Lord, there may be those right here this morning who do not know you as Savior. I pray, dear Lord, that right now that they would pray this prayer along with me in their heart. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I was born in sin. I've committed acts of sin, and I've turned away from you. But today I come and I confess my sin, and I repent. I turn around. I turn away from my sin, and I turn to you. I know, dear Lord, that you have shed your blood for the forgiveness of my sin, and I come to you today asking you to forgive my sin, to be my Savior. And today I decide that I am going to be a follower of yours. Lord, I pray for every person who's prayed that prayer and meant it in their heart, and that they have come to know you as their Savior and are beginning the journey of following you throughout the remainder of their lives and to be able to spend eternity with you in heaven. Lord, we pray your blessing upon each one. And Lord, in all of the things that would distract us as Christians, all the things that would distract us as a body, the church, I pray that you would help us to refocus on what it's all about, that it's all about Jesus. And as we go to our homes, and as we go to our workplaces, and as we go to our schools, and as we go to our neighborhoods, and as we go to teen camp, or wherever we may be going, may we go as followers of Jesus Christ. May we let our light shine for you. May we be unashamed of the gospel. And may we tell others of what Jesus is able to do for them And may we live in such a way that others would see the difference that Jesus has made in us. We give you glory this morning. Help us to be your church, not only for an hour when we gather on Sunday morning, but Lord, as we scatter to our various places throughout the week, may we be the church of Jesus Christ for your glory. May your people go with your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.